Amen. Hello, this is Pastor Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church. God's people need to hear some good news. I am trying to finish the book of Malachi today. I'm the visitation pastor at Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. And I want to ask the question, what does the book of Malachi say to us today? But before I do that, please accept my invitation to worship with us at the corner of Delray Beaches, uh, a corner of uh, Swinton and Lake Ida, 830 and 1030. Then we have the Bible study Sundays at 930 at trinitydelray.org. As I said, we're going to finish the book of Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament. I guess that makes it sound like we have studied all, all, all the books of the Old Testament. <laughs> all right, we didn't, uh, we didn't do it that way. We jump around from one book to another, but we're in Malachi chapter four, and here is the problem I'd like to address today. Too many people charge God with not being fair. In other words, they're saying God is unjust. Now that's not a fair, <laughs> that's not a fair accusation. In fact, it's not true that God is unjust. We'll see how that goes here. I want to ask Chris, are you willing to read from Malachi yeah. 4 for us? Of course. Um, it's between you and me. Uh, Carla, <laughs> and hopefully the uh, pastor, um, Glenn. Malachi 4, 1 through 3. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will stumble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze, says the Lord of hosts, so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stall, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord of hosts. That's quite a prophecy. Yes. And you see the distinction between verse 1 and 2 and then compared to verse 3. And that's what we're going to do right now. Malachi is preaching the word of God, and that word makes distinctions between the evildoers and those who fear his name. That's the, those are the words that he uses. He preaches the word and makes a distinction, and he says the evildoers will be set ablaze. That is a picture of hell. And that is a picture of damnation, one of the many pictures that God draws through his prophets and apostles. By contrast, those who fear his name will go leaping like calves from the stall. Now that's an interesting metaphor. If you can consider the mama cow <laughs> giving birth, and here comes a calf just this miracle of birth. I have never seen this. Um, maybe you did long ago, if you lived on a farm. Now, if you go to the state fair, usually uh, even the Palm Beach County Fair, that's where I saw one. You saw a birth. Yes, they, they have it in their agricultural area. Well, well tell us, you know, when the calf goes, comes out, um, very much alive and spirited, do they leap about like glad to be alive and in the, in the in the mother's care? I cannot tell you that because I don't think I stayed around that long. Oh, um, you didn't stay for the birth. Yeah, I, I thought you meant you saw the birth. Well, I did. I saw him come out. Uh huh. But I didn't stay for the rest of it because I, you know, you, I just didn't. I understand. Well, that's what happens. Just, just leaping and glad to be alive. This is the comparison. For them, those who fear God's name, yeah, uh, the son of righteousness, 
to be revealed in ich that day im Zoom mit meiner is, Kirche, aber ich kann is mit Christ. Dir. All right. Wo bist du? Was machst du? Yeah. Uh, the, Corolla had a, had a phone call and that's oh. um, sometimes that happens in the middle. I sometimes forget to put mine on mute and um, a couple of weeks ago mine rang so I'm going to do that now. I'm going to put my phone Moment, ich muss mal lauter machen. Yes. All right. For them the son of righteousness to be revealed is Christ. Can you tell her to mute? No. Oh. I, what I should do when that happens is pause. I want to talk about the son of righteousness to be revealed is Jesus Christ. All right. Malachi is preaching this distinction between the unrepentant unbelievers, the arrogant oh who trust only in themselves and the believers who trust God's promises. This is the difference between those people who believe and those who do not believe. The unbelievers do not trust God for their present or their future, and they don't trust God to forgive the sins of their past. Ab, ab the Lord is making this distinction. Well, the distinction. Right. Okay, good. But this weekend, you have to go. The distinction that the Lord is making here is that the arrogant and the evildoers will be stubble, like cut down, nothing there. And then the Lord sets them ablaze, and there's not going to be anything left. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. And you shall tread down the wicked. Now, there is a separation that goes on, as you know, from Matthew 25 between the goats on his left and the sheep on the right. Oh. And so you see the separation, the distinction that Jesus is talking about in Matthew 25 has already been made hundreds of years before. Malachi gives God's answer to those who charged him with not being fair. And this is, I said, what we're talking about. There are people uh, back then and still today who say, God's not fair. Look at what has happened to me. And they're not looking at the big picture. Uh, that's something we could study in detail at another time. The people who said God is not fair said, it's vain, it's empty to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge, which as I explained last time, keeping God's charge means keeping his requirements. So they said, why obey God? There's nothing in it for us. That is not the reason we keep what God has commanded us to do. We do what he has commanded us to do because he is God and we are not. And we belong to him. And just as a child learns not to go against the parent, so we as children of God learn not to go against God insofar as we are able. Although we occasionally stumble. And we ask God's forgiveness. But we don't say it's vain to serve God. That would not that would not come into your thoughts and certainly not on your lips. So I have to ask this question. What does God's justice look like? What does his fairness look like, in other words? Malachi gives God's word of promise to those who believed his promises. Those believers who know what God has said to them and guaranteed for them, they listen when God gives another word of promise, just as you and I do when we listen to a Bible study or when we listen to a sermon or when we remember God's promise to keep us and provide for us. I have daily bread even when I fail to ask him for daily bread. How about that? So do you. So God says healing will come for you. Justice for all who have faith in the Lord God. It doesn't always come right away. 
sometimes we have to wait for it. Yes. So here's a question for you. I think you're following my typography. My typography that I'm talking about is when I am addressing you, whether you're online in Zoom today or later on, and I print it in white on the screen, uh, we're turning the, the camera and the microphone over to you and making it more personal. So I ask you, why do today's believers need to hear and believe this good news from the word of God? Chris or Carola? Because we forget. <laughs> All right. We need the reminder. Why do we need the good news? That justice is coming one day. Because believers need to hear and believe this good news from the word of God. You know, if you think that things are not going right now, not going according to God's plan now, sometimes you just have to wait and see how he works it all out in the future. Or on the last day, when God will show himself to be just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus Christ. That's a quotation from the book of Romans. He is just and he is the justifier. That means he is the one who forgives and declares us right in his sight because of what Jesus did. And I that's what, go ahead, Chris. Uh, other than forget, we fall into sin, and, and the sin creates a disturbance in us to where we want others to pay for their sins and, and forget that we are also sinners. Ah, take the beam out of your eye before you criticize a brother or sister who has only a speck in their eye. Yeah. Yeah, we need to, before we point the finger, to realize there are three pointing back at us. And we need to hear and believe this good news. To believe is to trust it and say, all right, things may not be right now. And this person who sinned against me, I need to be more forgiving. All right. So the promise is that at the end, on the last day, you will tread down the wicked. There's a metaphor for you. Doesn't sound like it's very pleasant. It's not literal. It's a metaphor for those who are victorious in the end because of what Jesus has done and brought us into the kingdom of God, we will tread down the wicked. Well, why should we consider this good news? Why should we think of this as being good news? I feel the opposite because it's, it's like being happy that people are not coming to faith is a word but you know yeah well this is this is a picture of the last day yeah in the meantime the the wicked will still be wicked and yeah. they will appear to be getting away with murder yeah, even literally <laughs> but one yeah. day they will not be and we are not glad that they were not saved that's not what it says but God is having his justice, and he has a right to judge them. Doesn't sound like, well, some people's concept of God is really that God is unjust, that he will not bring down his condemnation on uh, the wicked. Right. He will. Mm -hmm. We are wicked, but we are forgiven sinners. Yeah. Our wickedness has been atoned for. Can I say it that way to make it clear? Yes. Right. Meanwhile, as we live in the here and now, wrestling with the daily news, oh, daily news of injustice and malice and lies and perversions and all sorts of I have to go then. All sorts of things. The people were not to cast aside what they had been taught in the book of Moses, in the books of Moses. 
Matthew, no, God's word had not been repealed. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that people treat the Bible as though it had been repealed and thrown away, but I'm talking about back then. We live in the here and now, and we restless. We are restless with these, these things that we can't understand and wish we could put away. But we are told that the people back then were told just because the wicked are getting away with it or appear to be getting away with it, don't cast aside what you've been taught. You see how they might be tempted to join the wicked and say, you might as well. But that's not what you do. So, Chris, I'm going to ask you to All read right. Malachi 4.4. 4. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and the rules that I commanded him at the Horeb for all Israel. And Horeb was where they were given the, the commands. And okay. yes, they were told to remember what. And, you know, that, those were on scrolls and they were read in the synagogues. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little uh, a try about why today's believers need to hear the good news that the word of the Lord abides forever? Why is that good for us to hear? Reinforcing us? I, I don't right. know. It would reinforce our beliefs, our faith, the, what we know about God. And it's this word forever is what I'm centering on. Yeah. It will not pass away. What God said then, even though it's thousands of years ago, it still applies. Mm -hmm. Congress cannot repeal what God has said. Thank goodness. <laughs> the laws of a nation, any nation, can be constructed so as to allow sin but it's still sin. You understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. So yeah. I've got some more good news coming. <laughs> I told you it would be about good news. Malachi 4, 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter just destruction. Boy, that is like a whoop. Yeah. <laughs> I, this, this, among some other things, is where um, I believe in the New Testament, some people thought Jesus was Elijah. Yes. It's like this. Yes, we're going to talk about that, because that's my first question. Who is the Elijah who shall come? Yeah. Do you know? Uh, well, Jesus. No. Okay. John the Baptist. John the Baptist. And he is the one coming to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. That's an interesting concept. The hearts of the fathers. There's two ways of thinking about that. And we're going to get at that just now. John the Baptist preaches a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And many were coming out to hear him and to be baptized. And others criticized John the Baptist for doing this. And some came out and they were not repentant, but they just wanted to join the crowd. So he challenged them. Jesus also comes preaching the kingdom of God is at hand. This is what accomplishes the mission of God to turn people's hearts in the right direction. And I said, there's two ways of thinking about it. One is that the hearts of the fathers are the fathers of the faith going back all the way to Moses, who really is the first prophet. 
the hearts of the fathers are turned to the children when what God has revealed through those fathers of the faith are received by the children. And, and the fathers have a way of loving those children, if you can understand that, in a distant way and the hearts of the children to the fathers. But there is a more immediate understanding of this and the problems that this preaching addresses are sin in general, the disunity in families. That's what we're talking about, the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, because there is such disunity in families. Both fathers and children need to repent of the sins that they have committed against one another. Now, I know that as a child, I committed sins against my father and my mother. And they were sins against God, right? But sometimes fathers who are, what shall I say, a bit overbearing and not loving, and not caring, they need to repent of what they have done in not raising their children according to the Lord's word. I think immediately, as most of you do probably, of Ephesians um, uh, chapter six. Uh, <clears throat> I'm in the wrong chapter. We are to raise our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And when we don't do that, we, the parents, need to repent. Because that's required of us in our office as parents. So in all of it, God's grace is what accomplishes what he wants to say. What does it say, Chris, at the bottom of the screen? God's grace what? Chris, are you muted? Oh, yes. I'm sorry. But what is it, it doesn't say God's grace. It says God's gospel makes I'm reconciliation sorry. possible. Yeah. I have to be careful that my screen doesn't get too full because during the Zoom call, I cannot read the bottom line. Oh. I have information down there that I don't know how to get rid of. So we're speaking about God's gospel, aren't we? The good news. Because gospel means good news. Now that means we get to a chance to go on to um, what we might call previews of coming attractions. Remember when you go to the movies? Before the movie started, you would get a little capsule summary of films that had not yet been released, who films that would be in the theater in the coming days and weeks. So that's what we have before us, the coming attraction. And what I intend to do in the next few weeks is to study with you the letter of St. Paul, the apostle, to the churches of Galatia. And notice it's plural here. Paul went in he was on his missionary journey, started or founded several churches, most of them in the southern area of Galatia. Next week, I'll have a map for you so we can see where that is. But what I have to say in summary is that these churches are in uh, what is now Turkey. All right. And these cities now have uh, different looking names, most of them. So here's an introduction, just an introduction to Paul's letter to the Galatians. I wonder if the people have uh, read this recently. You think it's possible that many people have read this part of the New Testament recently? No. Uh, it's not a letter that people read a lot, I suppose. 
I'm just looking at my notes. Um, but it's a letter that helps us distinguish between God's law and God's gospel. And uh, much has been written about the proper distinction between law and gospel. A man named Walther, W-A-L-T-H-E-R, in the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, wrote a book about the proper distinction between law and gospel. And he followed in a major way Luther's commentary on the book of Galatians. But Luther didn't invent the proper distinction between law and gospel. He found it in the book of Galatians. Wow. So it's a very interesting historical uh, perspective that we can get because we live in the 21st century. We can look back and see how God has led the teachers of the church to look at this proper distinction in detail and to see why it is necessary in all circumstances to know when we read the Bible, what part is law and what part is gospel. And even when we are looking at, at one verse, we might find law and gospel in the same sentence. We can look at that in detail in another, in another lesson. But I want to start this introduction by having you read, Chris, Yes. From yes. this first chapter. Okay. Um, so, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and the God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers who are with me. To the church of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good, and I thank you for that. Now, do you see any gospel there? Uh, yes. We've been delivered from sins. That's gospel, isn't it? Yes, I think so. All right. Even the word grace is gospel. Yes, exactly. In yeah. fact, when you say Jesus, there's gospel in that name because the word Jesus, as Mary and Joseph were told, because he will save his people from their sins. That's why he was called Jesus. Yeah. And of course, the, to uh, glory forever and ever, that's... That's gospel. Yeah. You see a lot of gospel there, don't you? The fact that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead is gospel to us. Yes. And then here's more... Well, we're going to study this in more detail. I don't want to spend all morning on one slide, but the gospel is so rich and powerful and... in in a place like this, in the first chapter of Galatians, we read uh, a loving way for an apostle and one who was the one who started that church, uh, those churches, I should say, in Galatia. He loves those people. Now, you're going to see a change in tone when later we go from the first few verses to, um, to the rest of the letter. But not today, all right? Not today. The letter of St. Paul, the Apostle, to the churches of Galatia. Well, here's the question. It's rhetorical. Why should we study Galatians? Well, one is because the gospel is there, as we've already demonstrated in the first few verses. Why study Galatians? Well, you're going to find out uh, together and I urge you to read the entire six chapters of Galatians in the coming weeks. But right away, Paul is going to discuss something which is the great problem, that they had distorted the gospel. The gospel distorted. Mm. And then he will 
to speak of the gospel alone. Only the gospel saves. The law cannot save, and the law cannot get me to do anything. He makes application of the gospel to the people and thus to us. Then in chapter 5, he begins talking about the freedom of the gospel. Oh, the glorious freedom set free to do what? Surprising answer, to do what God wants us to do and to do it with gladness. All right, I can take that. I have the freedom to serve God and to serve his people wherever I find them and to serve people who are not yet his people. I have the freedom and you do too. You have the freedom of the gospel, not the freedom to sin, oh no, but the freedom to do right, to please God and to serve his people. There is a response, therefore, to the gospel. Carola, I'm going to ask you to unmute um, while you were away, and I hope things are okay. Uh, would you unmute? Do you know how to do that? You go up here to these three little dots, all right, and uh, and unmute. You see those three little dots up there? Uh, <laughs> okay. Am I supposed to read it? No, no. I just wanted you to unmute. You did fine. The okay. response to the gospel. We're asking the question: Why would we study the Book of Galatians? And it's a rhetorical question. Here's one answer. People in our day, as in all days, people are attracted to other religions. Ooh. There are people that you probably know that consider all religions equally valid, equally true. Well, that can't be true because it contra they contradict one another. And if A is not equal to B, then we can't say that A and B are the same are equally valid. People are attracted to other religions. Another reason is to study Galatians is that false teachers have in the past and still do today pervert Christianity and make of it something it is not. We believe that the word of God establishes doctrine and also is a judge and a rule of all doctrine that shall be ever taught in the church of God. And we are against any false teacher who changes what God has said into man's speaking. That's always going to be a problem because everyone who teaches and preaches is also a sinner. Oh. And we seek our own glory at times. I hate to say that, but I know it's true. And I think you do too. And it doesn't matter whether those people are on your computer or on a TV screen or people that you know and when you go and you visit other churches. Not all churches have been in a, a mindset to have the Word of God as its only source and norm, the only source and that which controls what they teach and preach. False teachers have perverted Christianity. Why study Galatians? Another reason is that teachers have offered man-centered solutions to human problems. Now, that, that sounds okay, doesn't it? If it's a man-centered uh, 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 problem, then I ought to have a man-centered solution. They leave God out of it. Well, how's that working out for you? There are many books called self-improvement books, which may help for a while, but they cannot offer final salvation. And they can't really offer any comfort. We have had philosophers on the scene for thousands of years, offering man-centered solutions to human problems without letting God in on it. Doesn't work. The second, uh, the fourth reason for studying Galatians is that people live lives filled with self-righteous justifications for sin. 
Mm. You want to talk about that a little bit? Mm. No. You, <laughs> you don't want to talk about it. Well, <laughs> maybe you and I occasionally offer justifications for things we did wrong. Our justification doesn't hold water. No. I mean, do you want to offer that to God? No. Um, I don't want to go back into my history. It's forgiven. And I cannot undo it. I might try to offer a justification for sin, but it won't work in God's court. No. The gavel would come down and I would be condemned. My self-righteousness is garbage or worse before God. It doesn't work. I did it because. The children learn that early on. Let me give a personal example. I may have used this before. Pardon me if uh, I'm repeating myself. My parents always wanted to know why did you do that and i didn't really know why but i learned that if i could dream up a reason uh, they they would be a little kinder uh in their application of punishment you no know, i i had butter on my fingers so when i picked up that plate it slipped and uh, that's a very poor uh, example, but you see the idea was I was saying I did it because when I could have picked it up with the other hand or wiped my hand first and then picked up the plate, all kinds of things I could have done to not sin against my parents by destroying their property. You were preoccupied, your mind was preoccupied. Oh, that's right. <laughs> oh, that's still true. <laughs> You know, um, I don't think Jeannie has broken anything for a long, long time, but uh, sometimes the reason we get new glasses is because we no longer have a set of even four. Um, I try to do two things at once. I try to do something with one hand while I do another thing with the other hand. And um, my coordination now, you see, I'm now doing what I said we shouldn't do. I'm offering self-righteous justifications for not being more careful with property. It won't work. Even those who murder offer justifications. And they spend their time in prison trying to justify what cannot be justified. I guess we could do a whole sermon just on that sentence. There's another reason we study Galatians. It will help us consider this. People sometimes fear they have not done enough to satisfy the just demands of God's law. It's a different kind of problem. Yeah. I think that's not believing they've been forgiven. That's right. If I don't believe I have been forgiven, that doesn't change God's judgment. He still has objectively forgiven me, but I don't believe it. Yeah. So God will puncture through that. God will puncture through that by teaching and preaching to me through his appointed messengers. And uh, he will give me the opportunity to hear again that because of Jesus Christ, I am a justified sinner. That doesn't mean he has made my sin less sinful. That he has given me the promise that right now I am a forgiven sinner. I cannot do enough to justify what God demands. I cannot do away with yesterday's sin by doing something right today. 
Now, if I have a word processor and I type something out, if I make a mistake, well, this wonderful word processor will underline in red the, the misspelling. And if I ask it to, it'll correct it. <laughs> well, why do I need to learn how to spell? Because self-correction by the word processor might wind up with a different word than what I intended. As some of you have discovered with the autocorrect in the phone, it's embarrassing. Well, when I try to justify what I've done, I'm on the wrong side of God. If I feel that God has not forgiven me, there's only one solution to that, to hear the message of forgiveness, to hear Christ has died. And on that cross, he satisfied all of God's wrath. That's the gospel. I said that when we study Galatians, we're going to hear and see a lot of gospel. And that's such good news for us. It will never end that we'll need to hear the good news when we feel we haven't done enough to satisfy God's demands. God mm -hmm. says, I know. Maybe Chris or Carola, you have something to add. Okay. Why study Galatians? Mm -hmm. Many people who call themselves Christians cannot define the gospel. If I ask you, and I am asking you, Corolla and Chris, what is the gospel? I cannot define it, Pastor. I'm just not familiar um, enough. I cannot define it. You probably can, uh, but sometimes we need help just getting started. I do need help, yes. <laughs> and, and that's why we have Bible classes and sermons, and we even sing the gospel in our hymns. Mm-hmm. And there um, it is. I finished, Chris? Uh, I just finished in another class studying a very in-depth John. And um, I feel, a, a, and, and they say the four gospels, uh, you know, they were the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which told the life of Jesus and all the things that he did. So I'm kind of thinking that grace, uh, the life of Jesus or, or what he did, you know, what happened to him, is part of the gospel to explain grace. Now, that's all I can think of at the moment. Okay. When you put the cross in there, yes, you have the beginning of the gospel. Okay. Uh, what did Jesus do on the cross? He died. He died. You might say he couldn't do anything. He was nailed there. Oh, yeah, no. Yeah. But what happened as he died on the cross? What was happening physically? Um, he was paying for our sins in the sense, and he was forgiving them that actually did what they did to him. You remember that. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Mm. Forgiveness was on his lips, even though he was in the process of dying. I said, physically, what was happening to his body as he died there? And even in the hours before he died, before mm. he was crucified, what was happening to his body physically? He was being beaten, one thing. And his body was, he was bleeding, is what I'm trying to get you to say. Okay, all right. All yes. right, what do you know about the blood of Jesus? Oh. Um. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. 
First John okay. 1, I believe it's verse 9. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'm here to help you because I'm one of the teachers of the gospel. And I want everybody to know what the gospel is. Now, I thought you would give me a Bible verse that has the gospel. Who? Corolla or me? <laughs> yeah, well, either one of you. I'm sorry. You know this, you know this, and it's probably the most advertised Bible verse in the whole world, or at least in the Western world. And people just say, John 3.16. Oh. And what does John 3.16 say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Yes. You've heard that. Oh, yes, yeah. we had to write it five times okay. every day. All right. That is sometimes called the gospel in a nutshell. Uh, the gospel summed up in just a few words. For God loved the world so much. How much did he love the world? That he gave his son. Yeah. The sinless son of God. He gave him into death for our sins. Hmm. Yes. That whoever believes in him will not perish. That's gospel. But have everlasting life. That's gospel. It's connected with the death and resurrection of Jesus. So when I say many people who call themselves Christians cannot define the gospel, I think that what we need to be doing is tell them the gospel in a few words. Now here's the gospel in a few words. I believe that God's son, Jesus, suffered and died on the cross and that his blood is what God required and what God required Jesus gave and that blood cleanses me from all sin God forgives me and he wants me in his kingdom now and forever Amen. the gospel is God's love as it was given in the person and work of Jesus. So it's not the last time we'll teach the gospel. The church will go on preaching the gospel until he comes. That's our marching orders from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, and teaching them. And what we're going to teach is God's law and God's gospel. And we're going to distinguish between the law and the gospel. Hmm. Here's one way to distinguish between the law and the gospel. The gospel is what we must do. And the, the no, no, no. The law is what we must do. And the gospel is what God has done. I think you may have heard that in a sermon a couple of weeks ago. I heard it. So this is why people forget. People forget. And I yeah. think that the gospel is must be preached and taught repeatedly because we are we are tempted and likely to forget. So when I put this on the screen, it's not a condemnation, but a recognition of a reality that we're going to work on, especially as we study Galatians, because it is so full of the gospel. Yeah. You finally get me, huh? Yes. I need to go on. I want to look just briefly at a summary of this letter of Paul <laughs> as he wrote to the churches of Galatia. Who was the author? Paul. When was it written? Well, we're going to look at that. I'm not going to answer that today. Okay. But you can look it up. I think that it's safe to say, and you will probably agree with what I'm going to say. It was written during the first century. And to whom was it written? Right here. 
to the churches of Galatia. And we're going to have a map to show where that is. What were the circumstances? Oh, that's a lot of detail we need to go into. Can't answer that in one sentence, except to say the gospel was being perverted. Yeah. It was being changed. It was being added to. Can't do that. And Paul writes this letter with a great deal of anger because they had they had changed the gospel into something that was not gospel. The reason was is false teachers had come and taught them what God had not said. And then it is helpful for us not to just know what the Bible says there, but to make applications to our lives. If, if I know what it meant then, but I don't know what it means to my life today, I have not completed the Bible study. I think that sometimes this is the hardest part. I have to examine myself and my life to see where God's word applies to me now, today. And that's what God wants in his love for us to surround us what, with what is true and to hug us with the gospel of forgiveness because every day we need to hear this. Yeah. Hmm. And that's why we pastors urge our people to go and study the Bible alone or in groups like this. So what does this have to do with 21, 21st century believers? It should have been in white because I intend it for you. And well, that's they're no different than they were in the first century or whenever they started it, wrote it. The new church. We're no different. We're, we're, we're sinners too. I'm glad you said that, Chris. It's, nothing has changed, mm. really, about human nature. All right. So maybe we can do an, a, a summary in another way. Remember in school when you read something and then they said, uh, make an outline of what you've just read. Uh, Remember that assignment? Yes. Uh, did Were you good at doing it? No. <laughs> Not then, a little better now. All right. It takes some deep thinking. Well, I'm going to give you a brief outline. Part one, the defense of Paul's apostleship. And part two, the defense of the gospel, chapter three and four. And then finally, the defense of the gospel freedom. And I mentioned a little bit earlier. Well, that's going to kind of wrap it up for this time. We finished the book of Malachi, and we've given a brief introduction to what is going to be our study for the next couple of maybe three, four weeks. We are not going to do a verse by verse study that would take us way too long. Um, I'm going to try to look at what each chapter says and make some applications. We'll see how that goes. I've already started that. So I want you to pray with me. Um, and then um, we'll let you go on on your way to do the things that God has called you to do today. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your word addresses us. We are your people by virtue of your adoption. You have brought us into the kingdom of God with faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And we hear the word of Malachi announcing good news to us that though things seem unfair for the moment, one day it'll all be clear and you will come in your righteous judgment, condemning the guilty and forgiving all those who have faith in your son. Help us to properly distinguish between the law that you have given 
and the gospel where you have forgiven us. We grant that we may be as forgiving toward others today as you have forgiven us. We ask this when we ask your care and comfort for all who are grieving and hurting in any way today as we go about the, the ministry of the gospel, giving what you have given to us to others. We ask it in the name of Jesus. And God's people always end the prayer by saying, it is true. Amen. Amen.